Well, palliative care is about life. It's about making the most of life. It's about living right until the end. And so there is, there is no overlap, as far as I can see, between euthanasia and palliative care, except that if you translate euthanasia, literally, it means a good death. And it's, been, it's a word that's been, I suppose, hijacked in a way to mean this intentional killing of somebody at their request. If we look at it from a position of rights, don't I have the right to take my own life in the method and the timing of my choosing? You have a right to commit suicide. I can't stop you doing that. I don't believe that everybody has a, or anybody has a right to die. I think there's been a lot of discussion about the right to life and the right to die. I, I personally don't believe anybody has ever said that we have a right to die. There's a groundswell of support behind it, or at least a lot of publicity yes. about it. Where's that coming from, do you think? Well, I think, I think a lot of it is coming from this idea that we should have choice in absolutely everything we do. I think that the, the pro-euthanasia lobby are often representative of people who are fearful of having a long, lingering, unpleasant death. We see so much in the media about uh, prolonged dying and the, now with the rise in the incidence of people with dementia, for example, the fear of living a life where you're not quite aware of what's going on and that is fading day by day, week by week. That's one of the things that I think that is driving this desire uh, to end it all before we um, suffer too greatly. It's an understandable fear, understandable Absolutely. to what a choice. Yes. Well, the choice, is, the choice is a bit unrealistic because if we, if we had adequate provision of palliative care, universally across the, this country, in Australia, or across the world, then perhaps the cry for uh, euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide would be minimised. What are some of the challenges our society faces when it comes to legislating about it? Well, uh, as far as I'm aware, no jurisdiction has been able to create a legislation which is watertight. I've just been uh, speaking with um, senators in, in Melbourne about trying to create legislation which is watertight because the, there is a body that wants to do that in, in Australia. I think the difficulty is that uh, it's impossible to foresee every eventuality. Doctors are not particularly great at prognostication. We know that because most months I would meet somebody who a doctor has said, oh, you'll be dead in a week or you'll be dead in two weeks, and here they are two years later. So that's the first, the first difficulty. The second difficulty is that I, I believe that a lot of people will feel pressured into holding their hand up and saying, I'm just getting to be a bit of a nuisance. Why don't you euthanize me? Now the challenge for that is we know because there's evidence from around the world that about 25% of the older people in any population suffer some sort of physical or psychological abuse. This will just be another form of abuse that can be engineered by anybody within the family or, the, or their community. What's your view or your experience on the impact on families and also not forgetting the staff that provide euthanasia. Well, I think that I'll go to that point first because the staff are almost always overlooked. There's good evidence from around the world, particularly in Oregon and in some of the European countries, that people who have performed euthanasia have, have found that it's had such a profound effect on their ability to practice medicine that it's changed the way that they can do their job. Some have given up because they can't live with the belief that they've killed somebody. The evidence about families is not quite so clear cut because there are those who heave a big sigh of relief when granny's gone. And there are those who think, well, did we really have an option? And I think there is a sense of guilt. I think just as there is from people who commit suicide. That, that, that idea that we, we somehow weren't able to provide enough care. And I think for me, this pressure for euthanasia 
is a signal that we need to be very careful because if we, if we were able to provide good enough care, what would be the point of euthanasia? If we could look after our most sick and vulnerable citizens, friends, family, we wouldn't need to ask somebody to kill them, to get them out of the way. We would be there loving them, caring for them, supporting them, however sick they were. I mean, I think that's a sadness for me. This, to me, it says that maybe as a society, we're not providing enough care. Where do you see this debate heading? What about the future for this well, great debate? <clears throat> I fear that an attempt will be made to legislate in Australia. And I think the pressure is mounting because the man in the street is fearful of being left quadriplegic, in a vegetative state, profoundly demented, and not getting good enough care. And so people will say, I'll, I'll vote for that. Of course I will. The reality is, though, that the, the majority of people who, when you speak to them, uh, when they're quadriplegic, when they're sick, when they're beginning to develop dementia, they don't say, I want to have euthanasia. But my fear is that the, that groundswell of fear will produce some sort of legislation which we will continue to have to defend, fight off, or ultimately perhaps even work with. Is there one particular story or instance in your vast experience where there has been consideration of the issue of euthanasia, but it's gone to palliative care? I've had a lot of people who've said to me, you know, Doc, you must have got something in your bag. God, just, nobody will know. What those people are saying is, I don't want to live like this. And usually it's because they've got pain or some other distressing symptom that we can uh, ameliorate, we can improve. I've had one man who's persisted, this is one man out of my experience over 25 years, who persisted in his request for euthanasia. He was a strong member of the Voluntary Euthanasia Society. And each day I would go and see him and say, well, Bill, would it be today? And he would say, no, not today, but maybe tomorrow. And I think that's, that's a strong message, that people don't necessarily want to be killed today. They want to know that they've got a degree of control tomorrow. He came into our palliative care unit, we managed his symptoms, and he was comfortable. He lived right up until the end of his life. He, he, he stopped asking because it was okay.